Hi, so welcome back to the History Zinc podcast series. I'm Mallory Knight, and this is episode four. I hope you've just been listening to episode three, and this is a continuation of that, of my discussion of issues related to the European reformations of the 16th century and their impact on the development of the contemporary world. If you haven't yet listened to episode three, then I suggest you tune into that one first, as I'll be taking up here where I halted in the last episode. So, to return to the issue of Reformation in Scotland, and why did the Reformations happen? It's worth asking whether we attribute the Scottish Reformation solely to the power of its Protestant neighbour in England, that helped it to resist the attempts by France to maintain a Catholic power. If so, do we then reduce this to the simplicity of Henry's wish for a divorce from his first wife, Catherine, so he could marry his mistress, Anne Boleyn? Or was there some natural or cultural thirst in Scotland that could only be quenched by a successful overthrow of Roman, Catholic, Christian power? The history of dissent against Catholicism in Scotland before 1559 was a long one, as told, for example, by Knox in his History of the Reformation. There were certainly individuals who were prepared to stake and lose their lives to preach the new ideas that the Catholic Church saw as heresy, but which became the mainstream of Protestantism. These included George Wishart, Patrick Hamilton, Walter Mill, and not to forget the six martyrs of Perth in 1544, who all lost their lives as heretics of some form or other. Indeed, one of the Perth martyrs, Helen Stark, was accused of nothing more than failing to call on the Virgin Mary during her childbirth, as well as being married to one of the other martyrs. These all confirm the central argument of the Reformation, the power of individual conscience and the need for people to believe in the believable and not the so-called superstitions of the Catholic Church. But in many respects it begs the question, or it avoids the issue of why, if the Reformation was so obvious to people, then why it didn't happen a century or more before. The power and wealth of the churches was an obvious issue, as we've seen, going through the centuries. In England, Henry's Reformation was not solely about taking ultimate ecclesiastic power. It was also about suppression of the monasteries and the appropriation of their significant wealth and property by the crown, by Henry himself. In Scotland, there was also an economic gain for the nobility and the crown from the Reformation and the widespread destruction of monasteries. Prior to the riots in Perth, there was also the widespread dissemination of the beggar's summons, which charged all the religious houses to give over their wealth to the poor and needy of the society. It was a promise of ultimate redistribution of wealth and social justice, which never quite materialised. In this respect, the Reformation was about class and privilege, taking power and wealth away from the church elite and putting it in others' hands, depending on the context of where the Reformation happened. This was a political revolution in England that left most of the structures of privilege unchanged and largely strengthened by the consolidation of wealth and in many respects the same could be said about Scotland too. What changed was the theological discourse, which permeated into culture and society in new and different ways. What happened with the Reformation was, however, also largely dependent on new technologies of literacy. It was no accident that one of the foundational issues of the Reformations was the access to the biblical texts in the vernacular language, What fueled this, and fed from this, was the development of the technology of printing, or to put it simply, the printing press. The Reformations were largely the result of numerous small, independent, and often illegal presses churning out tracts and pamphlets for widespread consumption. This in itself placed a greater emphasis on the written word, and from there on to the role of education, as a means of teaching religious literacy, the need to be able to read the Bible and commentaries. But such prolific and largely uncontrolled and uncontrollable dissemination of information and opinion 
was itself an important factor in revolutionary and thus religious change. Thus one of the most dominant of social forces of that time, the undivided and hegemonic Catholic Church, was an easy target for challenge by the disruptive and revolutionary technologies of printing. But I remain intrigued about the question of why the Reformations happened in certain countries. We probably can't say there was a single reason in each case, but why did they happen? Or at least, how much can we take the respective nations' own discourses on the reasons for the changes that occurred? After all, the Reformation in Scotland was part of a long historical trend that had at its core the unification of Scotland with England, that began centuries before with Edward I in 1296, and materialised in concrete form only a few decades after the Reformation with the Union of the Crowns. It is about the continuing story of the political relationship between England and Scotland that was most recently aired in the September 2014 independence referendum. Or, to put this question another way, if England had permanently reverted back to Catholicism with Queen Mary in the 1550s, then how likely is it that there would have been a permanent reformation in Scotland? Is it more likely that it would have continued as a football between Catholic England and Catholic France? In such a world, the Scottish Calvinists and the Lords of the Congregation would have become footnotes of history, the equivalent of the French Huguenots. But I have two further questions to ask in this respect. First, how much did the relationship between Christian Europe and the Islamic world impact on the changes and the causes of the Reformation? Martin Luther was very aware of the spread of Turkish rule in Eastern Europe, including the fall of Constantinople in 1453 and later Belgrade during his time of preaching in 1521. The Catholic Church's holding of what was called the Diet of Speyer in 1529 had the dual purpose of attempting to halt the spread of Protestantism and also the progress of the Turks through Hungary and on to Vienna. At the other end of the Mediterranean world, the advent of Reformation came within a few years of the expulsion of the Moors from Spain. This was a point of European history when the only Crusades were for the re-establishment of Christian power within its own borders, as seen by the Christian Spanish. But there was a growing threat of Islamic military force in the East that, as we've seen, led to the Islamicization of much of the Balkans and threatened Eastern Europe. Within these developments, John Knox himself uses Islam, what he calls the religion of Muhammad, as a rhetorical foil for determining the boundaries between the true religion of the Protestants and false religion of Catholics and Muslims. The Reformation also happened very much in the crucible of an expanding Europe. Not only a Europe expanding into the Iberian Peninsula and contracting under the advance of Ottoman power, it was expanding westward with the discovery of the new territories across the Atlantic, being colonised, as we've seen in the earlier episode, by the Spanish and Portuguese, and also expanding southern and eastwards past the southern tip of Africa and into the Indian Ocean. As I discussed in episode 2, Vasco da Gama had been sent by the Portuguese to open up direct trade with the Indian spice merchants. That meant they could bypass the powerful Venetians and Arabs in the eastern Mediterranean, One aim was to find a way for making a pincer movement round into the Holy Land, to reinstate a new crusade, to re-establish Christian rule in Jerusalem. The outcome, though, was somewhat different. The Portuguese largely displaced the Arab spice routes in the Indian Ocean and built up new global colonies in India, the Indies, and onwards to the China coast. In doing so, they also colonised Brazil. Meanwhile, Spain carved up the rest of the world, and on the basis of the papal back Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494, expanded across the Caribbean, Southern and Central America, and also across large swathes of Southern North America, Mexico, Florida, Texas, and California. The vastness of the wealth of this new Spain posed new challenges, particularly how to exploit the land and its resources and how to understand the indigenous people of these new lands. 
It's well known that the Dominican Bartholomew de las Casas initially argued against the exploitation of the indigenous Americans as slaves, and suggested instead the use of imported slaves from Africa. He later retracted this argument and denounced all enslavement. But his was not the majority Catholic voice in this respect, and at the debate of Valladolid in 1550 he found himself debating against the classical theorist Sepulveda. His arguments against enslavement of other races by Christians were strongly countered by other voices that saw it as the Christian duty to exploit the bodies of other non-Christian people. These debates were profound in themselves and were to be echoed over 250 years later when the then ascendant Protestant nations, particularly the UK and the USA, began to question the religious morality of the lucrative transatlantic slave industry. In short, the European world was changing fast in the first half of the 16th century, and there is a strong case to say that these changes, and the challenges they created, were significant influences on the growth of Reformation. To put this simply, we often see the Reformation as having had an impact on the colonisation of America, particularly British North America. But the reverse may also have been the case. That is, the Spanish and Portuguese expansion in North, Central and South America, and also to the East into India and Southeast Asia, may also have been instrumental in the rise of Protestantism. There is no doubt, though, that the development of the Reformation, and in particular the ways in which the Protestant churches and sects developed, were very significantly impacted by the New World. We only need to think of the English settlement in Northern America, particularly the attraction of New England for Puritans, with colonies created in Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth and Rhode Island, all motivated and developed by a desire to create something new for Christianity, or at least to return to the pure roots of Christian community. These were, of course, largely in reaction to the gradual re-Catholicization of the English monarchy in the early 17th century, and with it the reactionary forces within the Church of England to reject Puritanism and other forms of separatist and pietistic Protestantism. But New England was itself to create its own tensions, and the figures of Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson, both of whom were exiled from Massachusetts Bay for religious dissent, are both foundational figures in American history. Hutchinson was a seminal figure as a woman preacher, persecuted for taking a stand as a woman. And Williams was an eccentric free thinker who largely thought himself out of and back into Christianity and who asked a series of difficult, almost contemporary questions about the meaning of religious liberty and the freedom of conscience. All of these discussions of the Reformation and across the globe interact with the other themes of this podcast – including the encounters and of slavery. I also have questions in the back of my mind about what some thinkers, such as the 19th century writer and preacher Theodore Parker, called the Second Reformation, that is, the rise of transcendentalism, the ideas of figures such as Thoreau and Emerson, and many others, that were part of the major religious changes in North America in the 19th century. And from my brief exploration of this so far, such rethinking and reformations of American religious thoughts in the 1800s are continuing to have an impact on contemporary religion and spirituality, both in America and elsewhere. I'm not sure where this will take me as yet, but it is something that I hope to explore further at some point in this podcast series. So, thanks for listening to these two podcasts on Reformation. In the next episode, I'll stay with the topic of religion, but instead I'll focus more particularly on Islam through the lens of exploring the history of relations between Europe and the idea of Europe and the Islamic and Muslim world. See you in the next episode. Bye for now.